good morning, Reverend Father General, Father Miro Miro, our beloved Father Provincial, Father Selma. My brother recollects friends and brothers of the Recoletos in the Philippines. Good morning. First of all, let me congratulate Father Emilio Quilatan for a job well done. And especially all of you who are listening to me, let me tell you in advance that my participation as one of the reactors in this lecture series of the history of the order came about by an invitation sent to me by Father Leander Barrot, the brain and the organizer of this project. At first, I was reluctant to accept the invitation because I was aware that Father Emil Kilatan has a passion for excellence. I know that Father Emil would not mind storming libraries, spending hours and hours in digging up history books and scanning archives, to the point that for us, Father Emil Kilatan is an acknowledged an accomplished researcher and an authority of the province of Ezekiel Moreno and the order. So I said to myself, with such kind of category lecturer, what's the need of a reactor? But then Father Leander explained to me, he said, that a reactor does not have to question the information or challenge the information of the lecturer. What is needed is that uh, the reactor would just give an add a little color, inject some kind of a saber so that the lecturer would be finding impact on the listeners of the lecture. And for that matter, I was found standing before an open window where I was given an opportunity to share some of my experiences as a religious order. So after that short explanation, I found myself accepting the invitation. First of all, I am been wearing this Augustinian habit for more than 58 for more than 50 years and to be exact 58 years as an Augustinian recollect secondly of that 58 years 35 was spent under the mantle of the province of St Ezekiel Moreno and 23 of that under the direction of the prior provincial of Ezequiel Moreno. These two provinces, St. Nicolas de Tolentino and St. Ezequiel Moreno, had a distinction of mother-daughter relationship. In history, the province of St. Ezequiel uh, Tolentino is the mother province of St. Ezekiel Moreno. These two provinces now stand right on hand. And now, for some clarification and distinction, some of my stories that I will share to you do not come from historical books, but rather they were experiences I have gathered as I walk along the years in the ministry of the order. And I admit 
that some of my stories could lack authenticity and accuracy, so it could be a subject for questioning. So with that premise, allow me to call to mind, first of all, the day that the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno was born. According to our historian, it was in November 28, 1998, during the 52nd general, the general chapter, celebrated in Munachil, Granada, Spain, that the Vicariate of the Philippines was elevated to a status of the eighth province of the order. The general structure, in particular, had 36 members during the, during the general chapter. The Vicariate of the Philippines was represented by two uh, members, two Filipinos. One was Father Victor Lutz, and the other, religious, had given the name of Father Emeterio Buñao. And so in that score, I have the honor and the privilege to have the experience of the pains, the trials, and the joys of witnessing the birth of the province. The general chapter was structured in such a way that three plenary sessions were scheduled every day. Two sessions in the morning and one in the afternoon. And it happened that uh, in November 28, 1998, during the second session in the morning, the presidential table proposed to the Capitolal Fathers the agenda of elevating the Vicariate of the Philippines to the status of the eighth province of the order. After the presentation of the reports coming from Father General and from the other Filipinos and uh, some other clarifications, secret voting was called. And when the votes were counted, the result was 36 votes in favor, zero votes against. The proposal was unanimously approved by the general chapter. The second proposal, the presidential table proposed that St. Ezekiel Moreno would be the patron and the protector of the new province. And henceforth, the province would be known as the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno. And after a short explanation and clarification, voting followed. The result was 36 votes in favor, no one opposed. So the second proposition was approved by the, by the general chapter. The third proposal, that houses and communities located in the Philippine Islands, as well as those of Linyan and Santimin, Taiwan, and the mission of Sierra Leone, Africa, shall fall under the jurisdiction of the province. After the votation, the result was 36 votes in favor, two votes against. The motion was carried. The fourth proposal stated that all Filipino recollects actually assigned in the territories of the Vicariate shall belong to the new province. Filipinos 
Filipinos living outside the territories of the province have the option to join the new province or to remain in the province they are actually serving with a proper arrangement with two provincials. And then, foreigners caught with the jurisdiction of the province may return to their mother province or apply membership in the new province. Voting was called, and when it was counted, the votes resulted in 30 affirmative votes, six voted against. The proposal was carried affirmatively. The fifth proposal, the presidential table proposed that the patrimony of the province shall consist of all the land and other fixed assets found in the Republic of the Philippines. However, the liquid assets and liabilities of the province shall be apportioned by 60-40 division. 60 of the assets and liabilities shall remain in the new province and 40% shall be shared by the mother province. A short explanation and clarification were given and after the vote was called, the result was 30 votes affirmative and 6 votes negative. The motion was carried. And finally, the general chapter declared that the incumbent vicar provincial is hereby appointed as the prior provincial of the new province. And similarly, the incumbent councillors of the vicariate are to be promoted to the category of provincial councillors. Furthermore, the general chapter ordered the interim government of the province to organize the first provincial chapter within 12 months on the day of the promulgation. Now, history tells us that the first prior provincial of St. Ezekiel Moreno is Father Victor Yutz OAR. And now, when everything was said and done, the 52nd general chapter announced that the eighth province of the order, the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno, is hereby officially proclaimed. And the proclamation was met with great jubilation and applause in the Capitular Sala. Congratulations, in Arabuena, handshakes were poured out on us, the two Filipinos. We became the heroes of the day. Now, before the session was closed, Father Victor Lutz, the first prior provincial, asked to be recognized. He stood up with voice full of emotion and joy. He made his valedictory address, thanking all the capitular fathers for their generosity. And particularly, he gave thanks to Father Javier Pipaon OER, his counsel, for sponsoring the creation of the province. You know, I love to think that Father Lutz was not look, talking for his own person only, but he was representing for the, all the constituents of the province. And he was speaking for and in behalf of the members of the province of Siquel Moreno, thanking the general chapter and now, I wonder if a copy of his valedictory address is still in our files. It was a beautiful speech. And when I look at the watch, the time check, I saw that it was 12.30 noon time, 
November 28, 1998. And I cannot forget, that was the birth day and the birth time of the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno. Happy and unforgettable event. Turning back, the birth of the province did not happen overnight. We may say that the pregnancy period lasted for several years. Our historian, Father Emil, pointed out that in the late 1950s, a group of Filipino religious voiced out the conviction that Philippine clergy, together with the religious, should be given a role in the management of the church in the Philippines. And there were six religious from different congregations who wrote a manifesto and sent them to the Vatican for support from the Holy Father. But sad to say, the manifesto did not have the popular and ecclesiastical report that it faded away. And one of the signatories of that manifesto was Father Salvador Calzado, OER. Father Calzado has the distinction of being the first recollect Filipino in the order. But because of his involvement in the Filipinization movement, he was moved out of Manila and was given a provincial assignment as a kind of exile to prevent him from joining the movement. But the initiation of the religious leaders awakened our government politicians to move for stronger control of the business activities of the country. So that in the 1960s, a law was passed where business in the country should be controlled wholly or at least the majority by Filipino citizens. Private schools were not spared from the compliance of the law. At that time, many school administrators were not Filipino citizens. And so they were supposed to be barred by the law. However, there was a way out. And the way out was to make and apply for naturalization. Referring to the Augustinian Recollects, and following the advices from other sectors, 22 or 23 Spanish Augustinian Recollects applied for naturalization. Many of them were officers and members of the administration of our Recollect schools. When this move was known by some Filipino recollects, it was interpreted as an attempt to, per attempt to circumvent the law in order to perpetuate themselves in power. So eight Augustinian recollects voiced out their opposition and they wrote a letter to Malacanang expressing their op opposition of the movement. And the eight recollects were identified as Father Federico de la Rosa, OAR, Father Walter Conde, OAR, Father Lino Agunod, OAR, Father Melchor Dano, OAR, Father Mauro Ambuboyog, OAR, Father Pedro Escanillas, and Father Hector Sungkayawan, and Father Regino Bancaya. At this point in time, today, only one remained with us. Father Bancaya is with us. So, that was the first stage of the attempt to find autonomy for 
our vicariate. Let me move on to the second wave, the 1976 provincial chapter. Our resource person and historian, Father Emil, has given us the details of what had happened during the 1976 uh, provincial chapter that was held in Marsilia, Navarra, Spain. Since I was there in the chapter, so let me add a little detail to the narration of Father Kilatan. Right at the start of the chapter, I was feeling uneasy because a warning was going around saying, Ojo, que vienen los Filipinos con bombas. And meaning to say, be ready because the Filipinos are coming with great surprises. Yet, actually, there were no surprises because the chapter fathers had the advanced copies of the 14 points position paper and they had time to demolish the position paper article punto por punto. And added to that, the paper of the Magnificent Eight added to the tension of the chapter because without my knowledge, the letter of the Magnificent Eight was in the hands already of the Father Bicar Provincial and also with the Bicar Provincial in Madrid. And they did not like and did not accept the positions of the Magic Eight. So that was the details that I remember during the 1976 chapter. And so, as the historian told us, we just accepted our defeat and we settled calmly to gain peace and division. However, however, my personal assessment in that event in Marsilia has taken and awakened the powers of Madrid that there were issues and concerns in Manila that they have to give attention and address. That brings home the events of the 1976 provincial chapter. And now, let me share to you my private conversation I had with Father General, Father Javier Pipaon. We back in 1990, or it was in 1991, that Father Pipaon, as the Prior General, came to the Philippines as part of his duty to prepare for the 51st General Chapter that was to be held in Colombia in 1992. I met Father General in USGR Cebu. And after lunch and over a cup of coffee, we talked together about matters of interest of the Filipino recollects. And then, at that moment, I reminded him that after our defeat in Marsilia in 1976 provincial chapter, we kept our cool and we buy peace and harmony. But I told him the desire for autonomy is still burning in the hearts of the Filipinos. And so, I asked him to elevate the Vicariate of the Philippines as a status of a province during the 1992 general chapter. His answer to me was flat no. He said, you are still too young to have it. And I told him, Konyo, I am already 60 years old, I am not young. But then, so I protested and I did not agree with his statement. 
citing the Constitution, I said, look, we have stable communities and houses. We have enough number of religious. Our formation houses are filled with seminarians. We have established parishes and ministries. And our schools are flourishing. And money? We have plenty of money to waste. So I asked him, what are you waiting for? His explanation was logical and enlightening. And he said to me, Bunyao, look, no doubt that you have established communities, organized parishes and ministries, high standard schools, you have plenty of money in the bank. But that, he said, but remember that these are the product of a hundred years of missionary labor in the country. Understand that hundreds and hundreds of missionaries, majority of them were Spaniards, pour out their sweat and blood to develop this recollect mission. With emphasis, he said, the recollect we carry it in the Philippines is a valuable treasure of the order. And now, he said, when the time came for turnover, it is prudent that the turnover should be done and be handed to responsible hands. And I admit, I admitted that his statistics were accurate. And then he added a statement which I cannot forget. He said, Livar y gobernar una provincia no es fácil. Para eso hay que tener religiosos bien asentados. Meaning to say, to manage and to govern a province is not an easy thing. For that purpose, you need to have experienced, dedicated, and well-founded religious. I said, Father General, I understand what you said. But I insisted that, uh, in a way, put the province, the Picardiate into a province in 1992, but probably the promulgation will be delayed for three or four years. But then his answer was saying, look, look, the structure of the vicariate is uh, still young, 38 average age. Many are still in the, in the formation houses. A good number are having only three or four uh, experience in the ministries. Only a handful had 40, uh, 45 or more age. So the province is still, uh, the stable is still young. And because of that, you are still young and have to wait. And when I insisted that it should be, I insisted that it should be promulgated a province in 1992 and delayed and asked for a delayed implementation, he did not give me any answer whatsoever. And when I look at my cup, our mug, our coffee, was empty and cold, and so he did not give me any answer. And now, our historian, Father Emil, told us that during the 51st general chapter in Colombia in 1992, an important ordinance was passed and approved. It ordered that the General and his Council shall study the possibility of creating a new province in the next general chapter. And since Father Javier Pipaon was re-elected as the prior general from 1992 to 1998, so the burden of preparing the new province fell on his hand. Definitely, 
He did his homework efficiently and effectively. And so, it is now part of our history that in November 28, 1998, this valuable treasure of the order, the Vicariate of the Philippines, was elevated to the eighth province of the order. Those of us who are present and the future religious of the province really should be thankful to the Council of Pipaon for handing over to us the treasure of the province of the order, the province of St. Mexical Moreno. These are memories that I kept to myself and I am happy that I have been given this opportunity to share this with you. My desire, my prayer, is that we should be thankful for the confidence of the mother province of handing to us our beloved province, St. Ezekiel Moreno. Thank you. Takang salamat kayo, Padre Bunyang, for your eyewitness account, for your own version and uh, interpretation of those cosas notables. This would uh, surely be a valuable contribution to the historiography of our province. Well, some portions of which are, for some of us, would be classified as untold stories or happenings behind the scenes which ultimately make us realize that really God rides straight in crooked lines. This is also a perfect illustration of the wisdom behind the Bergolian principle, time is greater than space. And now let us be ready for the open forum. We will follow the mechanics we had last time. We will give priority to those questions that are sent to us messaging our resource speaker and speaker and uh, the reactor may give their answer or interpolation our first question here from brother Jassi. aspect of our province make it characteristically Filipino Father Emil? The province of St. Ezekiel Moreno, before we call it the Filipino province, but however, majority of the members of the province, no, the majority is Filipino, no? but in the 2014, we might say, course of renewal held in Baguio, a Nigerian recollect gave a, a talk no? reminding us that we should not call ourselves Filipino province. Why? Because we make ourselves exclusively Filipino. Like in any other church or, or order, it should be inclusive. So just say the province of Ezekiel Moreno. Because aside from Philippines, we had foreigners, foreign recollects, who were also serving in Sierra Leone. At that time, we had, uh, we might say, one Korean recollect. And today, we have two, we might say, Nigerian recollects serving in the province so yes filipino i the, correct, what is filipino we are correctly filipino because of the language you speak no in luzon there are ilocanos tagalog kapampangan pangasinense in the south we have cebuano and hiligaynon no they have their own it's filipino but the language and the culture no must go was must not be the be the definition that calls us a Filipino province because it is unfair. It must it must be called we are should we should be we should be called only as the province of Ezekiel Moreno, which we also welcome other recollects of different nationalities who would like to join us and serve us. Especially now we are concentrating in Southeast Asia, where we are now in Indonesia and in the future hopefully we will, we will be in Vietnam after this pandemic. 
Because sooner or later, there will be Asian recollects who would be joining the province of Ezequiel Moreno. So we are not supposed to emphasizing a Filipino province. Rather, we are a province of the order embracing the nationalities of other people who would like to join us. But predominantly, the members are Filipinos. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. From, from the same person, Brother Jasil, and question is, what was the main challenge that the province experienced at the earliest days of the organization? Was there a community that posed a specific challenge to our missionaries? With a question? What was the main challenge that challenge. the province experienced at the earliest days of the organization? Okay, this is um, my answer personally, is that uh, when during the general chapter, when I learned from the Commission on Government and Finance that they were already proposing Sierra Leone as a mission, privately, I was, I was thinking that it should not be given yet to us for one reason we were a new province and we had just been created and we do not have the experience of having a province secondly the, the the mission in africa was too far away from the center manila so i whispered to father Lutz to change the proposal and hand it first to the uh, San Nicolas, the mother province. Then later on, we could handle it. But then the answer was that uh, the survey that uh, Father General made prior to the general chapter came out that 80% of the Filipinos were aspiring to have a mission. And so the Father General prepared an English speaking mission and that was the mission in Sierra Leone so I kept silent so that's one of the personal that is too early for us to be given a strong uh, far away mission but uh, I think history will tell us that the decision of the authorities were correct we had now very uh, good and challenging mission that we had and Thank we had already already a mission in Taiwan so to me it was it was no longer an issue a big issue for that matter Thank you Father Bunyang Father, Father Emil would you like to add something to that? Uh, okay so uh, I was also a member of the first provincial council held in Talavera the Fleet House in Cebu, that the first provincial chapter no, that was held in Cebu. I was a member of the chapter. So one of the things that we noticed is about the, the, the communities. No? Whenever we would like to accept any parish from a bishop, we would choose a poor parish. No, we have to be serving at the margins of society, of the, of the church, so we could you know, extend our the evangelization at the margins of the Philippine society. So that's one of the, the discussions we have. So whenever we accept a parish, it should be a poor parish. And secondly, the things that we have to encounter is the lifestyle of the religious, that we have to be faithful to our religious vows. No? Because one thing that, the, the thing that we are being challenged today is that the influence of consumerism and materialism are already creeping in our communities. So in the first provincial chapter, you know, one of the directives is to be faithful to our evangelical counts, especially our vow of poverty. That's all. Thank you, Father Emil. Now we proceed to these uh, interesting observations and we suppose that he is one of our brothers. The first observation and then uh, 
after this uh, the question. No? The, the rejection of the 1976 provincial chapter was actually a preparation for the vicariate to complete its gestation as a new child of the order. Thus, the preparation of religious sent to do further studies, the establishment of RFC, the opening of the novitiate, developments that were recognized by the 1992 general chapter. Uh, the second observation is, one of the aspects of the OAR that needed much attention on the part of the Vicariat was the mission orientation, which then was not much emphasized in the later part of the Vicariat. The questions now. Is the missionary spirit revived in the new province? May we hear more of this? Uh, I would like to answer that question. No? As it was shared with us with Father Bunyao, that in order to maintain and govern a province, we should have well-established religious. And in the 1976, we had only two seminaries, no? the Minor Seminary in San Carlos City, Negros Occidental, and the Philosophy Seminary in Baguio City, and the Novitiate, that is housed within the Philosophy House in Baguio City. And afterwards, we sent the prophet, newly professed brothers to Marsilia, Navarra, Spain, to, for their theological studies. No? In order to maintain a province, we need no? houses of formation who would give religious, produce religious, who would govern the province. And that formation house should also inculcate the charism of the order. So it's, it's, it, it, in the 1970s, no? what was the proposal? No? To let the religious study their theology in UST. But UST no, is a, has a seminary that would cater to other religious and to other, we might say, diocesan seminaries, but would not be able to inculcate no, the charism of the order. So that would be unfair. How could you study theology in UST and yet learn and imbibe and live the charism? So it would take time, no? That would be in, only in 1985 that the Recoletos School of Theology, Recoletos Formation Center, and its academic arm, no? That which is which we define today as Recoletos School of Theology, no? Was established in order to form, no? Augustinian Recoletos religious who would staff, govern, and lead the province. So thanks be to God, the wisdom of that, even though it was a painful experience, it was also, a, we might say, an eye-opener for all of us. That we have to prepare well. Without such preparation, because we learn from other, relig uh, uh, other religious orders of their difficulties in opening, beginning, and establishing a province. And there would be questions that would later prop up no, that, were, that would create more division rather than healing among the provinces of other religious orders. So we, we heard the experience of the Augustinians. We heard the experience of the Dominicans. So that was, no, uh, we invited them uh, before no, the general chapter of 1998. Their experience of their uh, becoming a province. Now, with those lessons no, from other religious orders, no, we learn that we have to be patient and prepare well. Secondly, the mission, we might say, we have, no, was at that time when we were still a vicariate in the, in the, from the 1960s, was Taiwan in Kaohsiung. Later, in the, late in the middle of the 1990s, we opened up the mission, in the province of San, San Nicolas opened up the mission in Sierra Leone, that, uh, and it was stopped by uh, members which are both Recollect uh, Filipino and non-Filipino Recollects. No? So the, the, the aspiration for the mission has been inculcated since the initial stage of formation because we are also a missionary order. In the 1908 general chapter, this was very much delineated no? that our order is missionary, but it opened a new dimension of our apostles. That's why in the 1908, aside from being a missionary order, 
with some ministerial, we might say, apostolate, one aspect that was opened up and legislated in the 1908 general chapter in San Miguel de la Cogolla before becoming an, an order in 1912 was that the mi mission we call the educational apostolate was already, we might say, uh, established and directed. And this would be realized only in the 1940s. But the missionary, we might say, charism is always inculcated in all, in, since the, the earliest stage of formation. And up to now, there are many Filipino foremans who are aspiring to become missionaries, especially in Sierra Leone and in Indonesia. Hopefully, in the future, no, we will be in Vietnam. That will be all. Thank you. Probably we can ask Fabiola, how was the missionary spirit revived in his, his term as the prior provincial of the province from November 1999, probably, up to February of 2003? Uh, let me let me add, if I may, an incident that uh, the emphasis before we became a province on that precisely inculcating our uh, our charism and our mission was an incident that happened in here in Miranila. I was the rector of Miranila. But we had a system that the classes were being handled in St. Vincent Seminary. And then it happened that one occasion, the Father Provincial from Madrid came over and he went around and he was looking for the theologians. Where are they? So I told him they are studying in St. Vincent Seminary. And I explained to him that we have a very good consortium with St. Vincent's. And his reaction was not very good to up to me, eh? because he said, Como, como, como is eso? He was emphasizing that Miranila was supposed to be formation houses for Augustinian recollects, uh, uh, in uh, giving emphasis precisely on the charism of the order and the missions of the order. Then he wanted that all formation process, even the theological studies, should be done in Miranila. And for that matter, categorically, he ordered us to stop our practice of consortium with St. Vincent. So we closed our, our consortium on the ground precisely that this is a formation house of the Augustinian Recollects, and we should emphasize the formation of the Augustinian Recollects 24 hours a day. And so he did not, that was, uh, that was the uh, kind of an eye opener for us that the minds of the superiors were really for the formation of our candidates to the Augustinian spirituality and Augustinian charism. And it should be done uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so he wanted then. And then I told him, uh, we need professors. I said, okay, you can send um, uh, professors back to, to Rome and then back here to do the formation process. So that's what I had sensed that the emphasis precisely is to when we were forming or pro going towards a preparation for a province is embedded in having solely founded Augustinian recollects spirituality among our candidates. And including for that is mission. The mission. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Uh, it's true that uh, we were we were we contributed you know, as a province to revive the missionary spirit by taking charge of, of the missions, foreign missions entrusted to us, Sierra Leone, Taiwan, Indonesia and even sent brothers for inter-provincial collaboration in the missions like Brazil, Panama, 
and later on Cuba. Thank you. Now we proceed to the next question here from the from the novitiate. From the novitiate. Aside from the territorial expansion of the province of St. Isikel Moreno since its inceptions, what other ministry or ministries that the province accepted and supported that are uniquely Filipino or Asian? Father Emil? Okay, so Filipino and Asian. No? Here in the Philippines, as I said, no, we were able to accept the invitations of some bishop. No? In the Archdiocese of Lingayan Dagupan, that is in Urubistondo, Pangasinan. No? And he donated the church and the land to the province. No? The only donation made in the history of the order in the Philippines. No? A, an archbishop donating a church and the land of the parish. Second, we open up, uh, we reopened, we returned to Palawan and we began accepting, we might say, temporarily the administration of the seminary of San Jose in Puerto Princesa and open parishes, um, administered parishes in Puerto Princesa no, and Aborlan. And in the north, the Pigarit of Taytay, no, the bishop entrusted the island of Kasian. No? And in Mindanao, we returned to Hinatuan, no, Surigao del Sur. But in the, early, in the early history of the province, no, the first mis parish that we accepted... ...and our culture to other congregations, to other things. And I think it's a big... Uh, development that we should be uh, happy about and we should be proud and we should maintain. Now, we are not just confining ourselves but we welcome other uh, religious congregations, even the uses and the seminarians to be formed within our formation houses. And I think the product of that will also contaminate to the other congregations. Minded that we should avoid the use of the word Filipino province. No, it should be province of Ezekiel Moreno, because hopefully, no, our our presence in the Philippines would be extended outside. No, we began we began in Indonesia, then Saipan, and hopefully Vietnam and other countries. We might extend our presence to other in the in the Pacific area. No, so that's why. No, one of the things that we have to be reminded of, no, we don't just use the word Filipinos. It's more, it's more inclusive. Rather, we should exclusive. Rather, rather the province should be inclusive because we can welcome, we are can welcome other Asian or non-Filipino nationalities. That's why the mission is an extra, is extended to all, and we are open to serve no, our Asian neighbors and be accepted by the local churches in those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. Uh, Father Bunyao, would you like to add to that? Or we proceed to the next question? Okay, next question. We have here from, again, from the novice, from the novice. How to become a Filipino Augustinian recollect in today's social landscape of the Philippines and Asia? This is a question of relevance, Father Emil. No, we have to go beyond our nationality. No, because the church is universal, not particular. We are Filipinos, yes. We, we bring our mores, we bring our mentality as Filipinos. But we have to go beyond that. 
No, because being a religious, being a Christian, you don't stick to your, we might say, national identity. We have to go beyond what is national. We are belong to a universal church. That's why whenever we go to other nations for mission, we don't impose our Filipino identity. We don't impose our Filipino culture in Indonesia, in Saipan, or worse, in Vietnam, or in China or Taiwan. Yet, we are still Filipinos. But what was the thing that we have to be reminded of? To learn the culture of the people whom we are serving. We call it enculturation. And the first thing to be of level of English is to learn the language of the people whom we are supposed to serve. Now, this is more important. Your being Filipino will not be lost while learning other, other, other cultures. Because you will remain as, as a Filipino whether you like it or not. Yet, when we learn other cultures, we are enriching ourselves of other cultures. And yet, we could see the common denominator of all cultures, which is Asian, not only just Filipino. Because whether we like it or not, we Filipinos, we are not considered as Asian because our influence for more than 300 years is European, West. That's why the Philippines is not considered an Asian nation, no? Because of our history. No, we were formed by Spain and administered by the United States of America and politically and men its mentality were imposed upon us. That's why when we talk of Fili a Filipino, we are not Asian in reality. We are, we, we are a different race from our Southeast Asian neighbors, as others would comment. But what I'm trying to point out, don't emphasize on your being Filipino. You are a Filipino no? No, to the bone. But in the mission, are you going to impose your being Filipino to the people whom you're supposed to serve? No. Learn the cultures of people. Learn their language. And that's the time they would accept you. And they will learn you being a Filipino who would like to live the culture of the people whom you're serving. And people with other Asian uh, and our Asian neighbors would appreciate that. That's why one thing about mission is that you go beyond your nationality. You have to embrace the people of different nationalities whom you're supposed to serve. And that you are a Filipino recollect, and not only that, you are a Christian, willing to share the gospel values in the language of the people you're supposed to serve. That's for now. Father Emil, uh, that is uh, on the level of being you know, an Augustinian, a Filipino Augustinian recollect, but on the level of doing relevance on the social landscape, social issues. What is the role of the Filipino recollect? Shall we be indifferent to the social issues in the Philippines okay. and in the Asia region? Okay. So, okay, thank you for the, part the particular question of, on that issue. We should not be blind, we should not be cold or indifferent to the political, social situation in our country, in particular, in the, what is happening today in our country. There are so many ways to address these issues. And one of the issues as Filipino, we have to voice out, yet becoming a recollect Filipino in addressing these problems. No? And these problems are very serious because they, they you know, we might say, endanger the lives of other Filipinos. How to do it? You know, that will be on the level of the, of the province. And each community who are experiencing difficulties in their own apostolates. You need courage to do that. And particularly, you know, because of the political scenario, you know, priests are being killed today because if you speak out, no, you are being targeted. No, for uh, in, uh, you are signing your death warrant. Are you willing to do that? Secondly, there are other issues. What we are doing right now in the pandemic, we are opening up pantries, extending help to our communities, to our brothers and sisters, no, to our social, we might say, apostolic program of the province. We that is also Filipino, and the Bayanian spirit is still alive. So we could do that. 
No? So this is what I could say because remember, in my experience, no, in the parish, I was only in the parish for two, three years. The rest is always formation. So my, we may say, my, my apostolate outside of the seminary is very limited. So it, it's, this is only what I could say. But I would like to invite Father Bunyao, what he could, if he could have anything to say, what is to be a Filipino recollect today in our scenario in the Philippines. Father Bunyao, if you could add some. Uh, uh, precisely, the, being that the uh, title of Filipino is accidental, I thought now uh, what is important is, yes, you cannot get away your nationality, your uh, whatever, your culture as a Filipino, but that one is supposed to be uh, carried together with the uh, with, uh, spirituality and the culture of an Augustinian recollects. So the two, Filipino, colored with Augustinian recollects or founded in Augustinian recollects culture and spirituality, is that is what is going to be used before the before our Asian, Asian brothers and bring it to them in the name of the church and in the name of the order and very, very circumstantial only as you're being a Filipino. And speaking of issues, then we should be aware of what are the things that are being circulated today and we should make our stand in conformity with our, with our, uh, with our conviction, with our faith and use that to correct what are mistakes that have to be done. This is how I believe that uh, Augustinian Recollects has to do. First and foremost, are religious with faith, but secondarily that you are a Filipino is just a secondary thing for, uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil and uh, Father Bunyal. We jump to the next question. Another request, sabi dito, the move to underscore the need to revive and relieve the missionary spirit aware of the problems the order faces, less religious in number, multiple ministries, secularized mindset, ushered the general chapters after the birth of St. Ezekiel province to restructure mind and organizational structure to ensure the revitalization of the OAR spirituality and charismatic identity. May we hear May we hear more of how the young province, how is she restructured in mind and organization? Does this restructuring foster the revitalization of the missionary spirit of the Recoletos? Thank you. Father Emil. Okay. Uh, since the revitalization and restructuring began, one thing that we, have, we are being reminded from our pro, uh, prior general is to review, to read, and reflect our constitutions. Because the constitution gives us the genetic map of our charism. And these are expre expressed also when we began the Agustin Recollect spiritual exercises, where we have to learn na, the, Augusti the Saint Augustine manner of reading, reflecting, and living the Word of God in our scenario today. So this, it is an ongoing. Because we go, when you talk about revitalization, it is interior, interior renewal. You cannot have this interior without guidelines. And the guidelines begin with our constitutions and other, we might say, we might say exer uh, spiritual exercises that we need to in, in order to review and to live that, that charism through the words of St. Augustine, of how he lived and taught his charism during his time. And it's still relevant. Augustine is still relevant. And the third point of this revitalization and restructuring, first of all, we are here to form quality religious, not just numbers. And there's a, there's a, there's a decline of, we might say, of, of seminarians entering the seminaries, particularly when they reach the stage of the novitiate and when they enter the theology, it's low. But what is important is not the number, it is the quality. 
the quality that this four months, no, from the minor seminary, from Baguio, from the novici, pre novitiate and novitiate, the question is, they were, were, were they able to imbibe the spirit, the charisma of the order, and to move on? This is the challenge of formation today on the level of you know, initial. How about the continuous formation? We are still doing our best. We have our materials coming from, from the general curia you know, in order for us to learn more, to imbibe more our charism. That's why this is a learning process called, we call continuous formation. This revitalization, is going, it, will, it will not stop because once we begin it, it will continue. But never lose the sight of what the, the most important book in our lives, as the OAR constitutions. Because the constitutions, you know, the OAR, serve as the anchor of our identity. It's like a ship. A ship with, with, without an anchor it will be tossed by huge waves no, of experimentation and to the point it can, it can destroy it and overturn it. No? And what would happen to the ship? It will sink because it has no anchor. Let us anchor ourselves with the Constitution and be, read it as, as our spiritual guide. No? Restructuring is external organization. No, that is easier. But as a recollect, that's different because we have different mentalities. No? And as I said before, no, the materialistic and the ex secular mentality of running a corporation is being what? Is are creeping in the way we, should, we are running our apostolate. And that's dangerous. There are some points of running a corporation which has... The, the methods are good, but not all are acceptable as religious no? in running an apostle, in leading the apostolate. So, as a, as a historian, I could see that the struggle of being a recollect during the period of history in the Philippines, during the time of the province of Sanit, these were the challenges of our superiors, of what we call the danger of falling into activism. You are fully active. You are active as a parish priest, missionary, and there was a danger of losing your identity as a recollect. And this danger is always present. And what we are doing right now is, again, we have to, ha have, to have a break and look who we are now, where, where are we standing, and review what are we supposed to do as recollects. So this is the, the, the thing that I would like to share with you. It's not an easy uh, process no? because the mind of a person is not like a switch. It has to be conditioned continually. And this is through our spiritual exercises, our meeting together as a community, and most of all, no? our reading and learning of the OAR constitutions. Thank you, Father Emil. The revital section and the restructuring of a part of a province should always be in consonance with a process undergone or being undergone by the whole, no? the whole order. I don't know, Father Bunyang, would you like to say something on this? Yeah, I, but I echo the, the commentary of Father Kilatan on the question of revitalization. To me, revitalization should really be considering the, the, the rule of St. Augustine and our constitution, which is the basis of the lifestyle and the values and the practice that we will be carrying out in the public. But if we do not know the rule of St. Augustine, if you do not know the constitution or do not, the worst is not, not to accept the constitution's uh, instructions and values, is the very damaging. So the first thing that I would believe to implement and to live up the revitalization is internalize, learn, internalize, and accept the spirituality that is embedded in our constitution. Without that, very difficult to consider an effective revitalization because this will be translated in whatever form in, in, in any communities that you encounter. 
and you are an Augustinian recollects, but you do not know and you do not believe and you do not behave according to the constitution, to me it's not it's not a kind of a way of life, but rather more that needs to be revitalized, internalized and accept the constitution. I thought this is the call for the revitalization. A call for all of us to read, to know, and understand that 12 chapters of the Constitution and accept it as the textbook of our life. Yes, Father, there's always a need to go back to the sources, to our standards against which we have to evaluate ourselves. Who bodies? Where are we now? Thank you very much. We we proceed to the question coming from Sister Corazon Padua. Unity is much desired in any corporate setting. It was said that the journey was arduous. Masakit yung comment na ingrates. But uh, what is awe-inspiring is the observation of unity. What lessons could the order share to the Philippine political opposition to obtain unity? Am I correct in saying that the move to Filipinize the religious orders, schools, SNC, etc., was fomented during the martial law years? This is a hybrid of Recoletos and uh, our political situation. Father Emil? Uh, you want to say, Father? You want to say? Okay, come on now. Okay, so you know, when we talk about the Filipinization, is that, that since 1957, the 1960s, 1970s, no Filipinos, the members of the church would like to ask for more responsibilities. It's our church, not the church of the foreigners. No, they would be like to be cola and prepare more and to accept more candidates in their congregations. No, in other words, they better collaboration and they were silenced in the 1950s again another movement in the different religious order came about no in order to to ask for more responsibilities and greater participation in the governance of the order now they would like to be also active party not just not just being assigned no secondary position they want to be active that's natural that's that's human the 1976 uh, provincial chapter taught us many things no? that in order it's easy to become a province but the question can you maintain sustain a province and it will take years to do that no? that's why father Javier Pepe he was I think the provincial at that time later he became a general even though it was not, not accepted well he had a point we have to wait, we have to prepare, and two things that we have to be, two virtues that we have to, to learn while, while preparing. That is humility, and second, patience. We have to prepare well. No? Let us not fall into the mistakes of other religious orders who were, no, have difficulties no, in maintaining a province. No? We should also no, be prepared well. Now, how about the political scenarios? In the, can we apply that in, this is polit, Philippine politics, and Philippine politics and politics in, are dirty. Okay? No, dirty. There will be vested interests, no? ulterior motives. No, we cannot apply the religious, we might say, uh, movement of our, of our predecessors to this because the political scenario in the Philippines is is um, it's it's too secular. Well, in our case, no, it's religious. We want to share more. We want to collaborate more. And time was the essence in order to do that at the proper time. And that proper time was only given to us in 1998. Now today, no, in the year 2021, we have still difficulties. And thanks be to God, thanks that. The care, the care of the mother province and the patience of our no, previous provincials, no, we are still moving on and surviving. Because remember, the treasure that the recollect missionaries gave us, no, especially in the Philippines, 
is always precious to the eyes because the Philippines was the, the reason why the Recoletos is still existing today. They were almost extinct in, in Spain. Of the 33 monasteries, only one survived, allowed to exist. Montego de Arnovisite. Why? Because it was forming missionaries for the Philippines. And thanks to the Philippines, you know, the order survived. Now, this is religious. No, there is where the God is the main protagonist. We are just his intro, instruments. But how do we respond to the challenges of the signs of the times in order for us to become a province? And that, that it is written that by the history of the Philippine Recollects and also the Spanish Recollects. Yes, in the 1976, it was we might it was quite we might say um, words that were used which are imprudent. Because th those were the, the times, no? And remember, you're talking with Mexicans and Spaniards. They see different things differently from Filipinos, no? And again, another thing that, again, that we have to accept, there should be a racial, we might say, differences between us, the Filipinos, the Spaniards, and the Mexicans, who were participants in that chapter. So racial differences also play a lot in that decision. And one thing that we have to be aware of, no? that at those times no, were different until 1998 when things were prepared thanks to the efforts of Father Pipaon and the rest. No, it was high time for the Vicaria to become a province. It was an arduous road because that road, even though it's arduous, it was the road that was right and ripe in 1998. Thank you. Thank you. Father Bunyal? In comment that uh, the Filipinization movement started during the martial law, I think that is a political uh, reality that, uh, you know, with a strong emphasis was in the 1960s, 1970s. But it doesn't mean that uh, because, uh, what, we were, we were uh, not moving along that uh, direction of some other congregations, but yet we have our own way of expressing the time and uh, that, uh, that time was that uh, we do it according to our constitution and our culture. We were not very vocal against or what of the government, but we had our own way of developing our identity towards the political situation. We were not known as the uh, radical religious but we does not mean to say that we were not sensitive of the situation of the country and uh, we do it according to our culture according to our religious conviction thank you father since we are on the topic on philippinization this question from sister herminia villanueva is also relevant has any philippine recollect religious personally experienced anti-Filipino treatment from the Spanish Recollects while they were the majority in the Vicariate, now province of St. Isiquel Moreno, especially when the Filipinization movement was initiated. Thank you. Uncle, my answer to that is that, uh, yes, there were some Filipinos who had been a perception, a perception of the having anti-Filipino behavior. But uh, I believe, as I have, a, I have uh, encountered Father Pipaon's explanation, there was no deliberate and intentional way of antagonizing the Filipinos. Rather, they were trying to work out in such a way that uh, the order would continue to be in harmony with the Filipinos and all their members of the community in a manner without hurting anybody. Now, if there were some members of the Filipino community who were, who were saying or expressing that they were ill-treated, uh, that is a perception, probably true, probably no, but that was not intentionally be the plan of our superiors and our authority. They were just trying to work out what is, what is uh, 
viable, what is doable, and what is more acceptable in the culture of the Augustinian recollect. As Father General explained that uh, there were some who were very, very eager to hold on to the power, but he was trying to hold and prevent it because there was still time for maturity and uh, waiting time. And that's why if those people who were feeling antagonized, then we should understand that there was also reason for behind it. That is why in my, in my belief, this uh, giving us the independence in 1998 should erase that resentment and antagonism that has been existed in certain period of time. We should now realize that, uh, that the delay in handing over to us the vicariate as a province was not intentionally to hurt but rather more to preserve the treasure, as the Father General said, that he has been developed in the course of the years of three, uh, 400 years labor. So if there are resentment that is going on now, I hope that they will understand that it was not intentionally or deliberately done. Okay, Father Bunyal, thank you. I don't know from the historical point of view, Father Emil, when he was Father Federico de la Rosa and he shared with me his experience in the 1976 chapter because he was the one who presented the paper or the ponencia at that time no? and there was really uh, the difficulties no? and he said to me one recollect even shouted because remember when you talk about Spaniards they are European they are more vocal they are more passionate of what they say no? they are Vocal talaga. They, they, will not, no, they will not withhold of what they feel. No? There were unkind, unkind words were, that were hurled against the Filipino recollects. And even one point, one recollect called the Filipinos as monos, monkeys. No? And uh, the, the, no, the head, the, the president of the chapter told that religious, you have to apologize. You, you should not have that. Yes, one recollect said, told me, the recollect Philippines are English and even called what? They called the Philippines as monkeys. He shared with that, that experience and he was hurt. Thanks to the intervention of the president of the telling that religious who's a Spaniard to apologize of what he had said. So that was the thing that he explained. There it will be racial discrimination. Remember, the Spaniards have this that you're, that that's superiority, no? Even though that, Pili that uh, Spanish record was, was assigned in the Philippines, no? he will all have that, 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 that racial superiority. And then I even experienced that when I was studying in, 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 in Rome between 94 and 98, when we were still under the vicariate of, the, of San Nicolás. I already experienced that, that feeling no? of superiority, but yet I still, we might say, serve as a religious. No? There will be uh, racial discrimination and it would be expressed in different levels because races no the difference of races would always exist no the different what we call racism today would always exist in different degrees but thanks to the you know, level-headed religious of our order no we were able to hold that 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 racial or racist mentality you know, thanks to the universality of the constitution and some and many majority of the religious who were at that time present to hold their peace so when i was assigned in rome i i felt this discrimination there is but one thing that i always keep in mind i am an augustinian recollect and i will obey as an augustinian rec i will only obey where charity demands and that's the thing that, 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 that keep me in the order. My fidelity 
and the obedience I owe to my superiors, you might due to the vows of obedience. And the thing that they are asking when they command me, it should be done in charity. And in spite of the difficulties that I experienced no, between uh, my Filipino recollects and my Spanish brothers and other nationalities, we were able, at least we were able to maintain, as St. Augustine says, one mind and one heart intent upon God. No, it's difficult. As I said, being a religious and maintaining a province and proposing to become a province, two virtues are necessary. Humility and patience. And hopefully, you will understand the situation at that time. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. We proceed to the question from uh, Ponce Jr. Very curious. Were there major changes and challenges in the OAR educational apostolate and institutions in the Philippines during the declaration of the province in 1998? What was the reason why, from 1998 until the present, only a few additional educational institutions owned and administered by the OAR as compared to the Paris Apostolate. Thank you, Paul. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, since 1998 up to the present, we did not have uh, introduced many additional educational uh, schools. We had maintained two universities, UNOR and USGR. They were already uh, existing before the, before the province was created. The colleges of San Sebastian, Manila, San Sebastian, Cavite. And I don't think that there was an additional except some like extension of San Sebastian in Canlubang and some other things. Then the question is, why is it that we are not multiplying our schools but and yet we are multiplying our parishes? My answer to that question is that probably there is also a practical reason for that. Nowadays, educational institution is very well what we call uh, uh, control and it has so many requirements whatsoever and it is not easy and it's not easy to be expanding institutions unless you are properly prepared uh, fundamentally for all the expansion so probably this is one that holds on but even though if we have not we have not done multiplying we have done is improving the quality of our educational institution. I think we can be proud of our universities and colleges that they are having their names and their names as well there. To me, that is very important rather than multiplying uh, institutions. Um, the regulations that the government has imposed on our schools do not really favor organizationally and financially for more educational uh, expansion. Private schools today in the Philippines is having a hard time to maintain financially and sustain financially because of the balance between income and, and expenses is very difficult to send. But as I said, we had our institution that has been handed to us and they had maintained it and improved it to the event that it is now accepted as a well-established institution. Um, that's my answer to the question, why is it that we did not have expansion of uh, additional schools, whereas there are yes, more Father. parishes offered? Because you, there were bishops who were inviting us to, to, uh, to the, in their diocese for us to enter. Father Emil, would you like to add to that? Uh, yes. May I add uh, a note to this? The expansion of our educational apostolate. First, uh, during the time of our present provincial, at uh, the time of Father Dionisio Selma, the Ijokan community, San Pedro Academy, uh, I think it's already uh, a, a school separate from the San Pedro Academy in Maine in Valencia. No? I think that we have to... Uh, an improvement of our educational post in that area in Kaijokan. 
And during this term, no, um, a school in Alfonso Cavite, Sacred Heart School no, in Alfonso, was sold to the province. No? And this is also, it is now under the care of San Sebastian Cavite. So this is also an, some improvements of our extension of our educational apostolates. No? To, men, to, to maintain a school is difficult. It's much, it's much difficult rather than maintaining a parish. That's why uh, it is a slow process rather in, in the uh, educational approach. We could not open up more schools because of some difficulties of the strict laws that we have to observe, no? From CHED and from the DepEd, no? And also from the, uh, we might say, other uh, 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 government bodies in order to maintain the standards of education in the Philippines. That's why we are accepting more. It's much easier to maintain a parish rather than a school. So that's the scenario we have today. But they are, we are still maintaining the schools and accepting such apostolates. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. We proceed to the question of Professor Romanilius here. The Spanish missionaries came to the Philippines, learned our languages and enmeshed themselves in our culture. That was a demand by Filipino recollects in the 1970s to assign new Spanish missionaries to parishes first before going to schools as administrators. This is a comment from uh, Professor Romanilius. Any observation, Father Emil, to that comment? Actually, there are, there are, because remember, in the 1940s, many of our, uh, during that time when we opened the educational apostate, the provincial at that time began preparing uh, missionaries to study English in England and in the United States where they could earn uh, civil degrees because their focus is to uh, open up schools and become teachers and administrators. Okay? That's why many of these priests a recollect priests who were assigned, no? they went to England, they went to the United States. In order, some became formators in Baguio, some became administrators in the university because they have those degrees not that they earned in the, in, the, ano, in, the, in, the, in the United States and in England. That's why many of them, even though they were so long, many, or some of them uh, could hardly speak the native language. No? I met one recoleto. He had been in Manila for so many years, 10 years, and he could not speak Tagalog. No? So because his work is school administration. But there are some recollects who were immersed in the parishes, especially in Palawan and in Negros and even Cebu. No? They learned the language of the people. So the proposal was these people, before becoming school administrators, should become first what? pastors of pastors who could learn the language of the people. So this is what was one of the proposals of this uh, 1976, we might say, provincial chapter at the time. So this was the thing that you, that our recollect mission, really, no, I met up to now, there, some of them are still alive, who were assigned for so many years in Palawan, in Cuyo, in Agotay, they could still remember the language they spoke with the people. No, Father Jose Francis who would speak Kuyunin, Tagalog, no, Ilocano, no, Agotainem. No? We have also Father Jesus Recio who could speak fluent, Hiligaynon. Father, Father, Ma, uh, Father Martinez, Jose Maria Martinez who could still speak fluent Cebuano. They're still alive and they still have connections with their former parishioners via Facebook and they could speak the language of the people that they, are, that they are communicating with. Okay, so that's, that's the thing that we have to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. We have here words of uh, acknowledgement and gratitude from Jennifer Sibayan of Our Lady of the Visitation Paris, the Orvis Tondo. And sabi niya, we, the Our Lady of the Visitation Parish, the Orvis Tondo Pangasinan, joyfully and wholeheartedly accepted the OAR community in our parish. And to be honest, we are all very happy, thankful, and blessed that our beloved Archbishop Socrates Villegas Didi made the decision of donating our parish to the Visayan Recollects. 
We are all indeed blessed to have the OAR community in our parish because your presence in ministering in us had brought us so much joy and peace in our Catholic Christian life. The OAR priests and the whole community had inspired us so much to deepen and enrich our faith to God by embracing the Christian rule of life and its courage. And we are now living a meaningful way of life following the teachings and examples of our superiors, primarily anchored on the Augustan rule and the charism of the order. We are so thankful to God. We are now and forever be members of the OAR community. Furthermore, gusto ko po magpasalamat sa pagkakataong to be one of the trial aspirants of uh, SARF, the oldest condo. Okay, gratitude coming from the heart. And then here, question from our brother, Father Arnel Diaz. Can you give us your personal assessment on how the St. Isikel Moreno province lived out at present the Augustinian Recollect ideal, referring directly to our charismatic identity and to our different areas of apostolate in the Asian context on the basis of the ordinances or the LAMP, no, the Life and Mission Project, approved by the highest authority of the order? The assessment. Assessment. I think that uh, the, the observation that was given by Father Arnel is all right. We have done our best to comply with the lamp. We recognize that it has an authority. And to the best of our ability, we try to fulfill what is mandated and to bring the spirit of the lamp to whatever ministries we are assigned. Now, the degree of the accomplishment may just be different. There are some who are perfectly acceptable, and there are some which might be uh, lacking in sense. That, that is part and partial of the process of uh, implying and complementing and implementing the lamp. But there is a conscious effort in every community to live up the lamp. That is part and partial of our uh, meetings and our uh, formation process that we go into the lamp and try to implement it. Now, how good is the implementation? Uh, sometimes it depends on how organized the community. So, we have been trying our best to, to live up to the spirit and the mandate of the lamp. Uh, I will leave to the individuals how much or even to the researchers, how much of the spirit of the lab has been implemented in the course of time. Probably there is a need to kind of have a kind of evaluation on how much of the lab has been being completed in every, kind, in every community. In order to see that, uh, encourage that every community has to follow the lab. For those who are, who are not familiar, the lab is actually the local or the temporary rules during the term to be complied. And everybody is uh, asked to live to that lamp. Okay. Uh, now, the lamp is the thing that we have to be considered, no? the life emission project of the order and applied to each province and each province to each community. We have to be reminded of that the lamp is just, we might say, what we have decided should be implemented. So there should be, uh, we might say, effects. No? It is not just our decision in the provincial chapter or the general should not remain dead letters. No? This is the mandate, how should be up, how should be applied, how should be translated, and the, 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 the effect should be the output of that mandate. That's why the, this is uh, one of the approaches of how we should, uh, we might say, apply the mandate and how effectively are we going to put into action the mandate into, in, in order to have its desired effects. That's why merong mandate, what is the way to apply and implement it, and we should have the results within 
the four years of the province. And this would be evaluated by the next provincial chapter. So each community no, would be evaluated and this is, it depends upon the local superior, the local prior, who is heading this committee of how the LAMP should be implemented. I, must, I have been assigned in Recoletos Formation Center since 2009 and uh, the time when the LAMP was implemented, we were able to, we might say, um, with some effects, no? the, 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 the mandates that we were able to, uh, we might say, um, implement and have some others. Others, we, we, were, we were not able to apply because of some difficulties and circumstances of that time. So this would be evaluated and now we will go back again of how this problem should be solved. Not as one person, but as a community led by our prior provincial and his council together with other the local superiors. That will be for now. of the secular fraternity affect the formation of the province? If there was not much effect or effect, what more can the secular fraternity do to assist more the development of the order? May impact ba yung SARF? Could you repeat? Could you repeat the questions? How does the presence of the secular fraternity affect the formation of the province? If there was not much effect, what more can the secular fraternity fraternity do to assist more the development of the order? Okay, so nowadays, especially in the Philippines, every community has an attached uh, chapter, they call it the SARF chapter. And they are the lay women and men who are living the charism and the even helping the apostolate of the community. Now, there are uh, South chapter who are very active and very well organized in relation to the community. And we thank, we thank God that these people are there because the concept of the SARF is actually leaving the charismatic identity of the, of the curriculators, not as a religious, but rather laymen living outside. And so their life is to be carried out as if they were Augustinian recollects. So they are the frontliners, we may say, in their homes, in their workplaces, and in their relationship on how to live a Christian life in a pattern after Augustinian recollects. That is what is the self meant for. And I am very happy with the self organization in the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno. They are well identified with us. Now, what more can you ask from them? To me, they have done already good. And to ask them more might be forcing them to leave, our, to leave their homes and to live in our community, which is not proper. So what we would like to emphasize is uh, work together with them and influence in their hearts and particularly in their homes how to live a, a Christian life according to the mentality according to the culture and according to the uh, spirituality of Saint Augustine. For me that is enough that you have a family living in the world but living in the values of Saint Augustine and the gospel. That is the duty and the job of every spiritual director of the SARF. What can I say about the SARF in the Philippines or the province of Ezekiel Moreno. I have no mm, criticism. I have been happy with their, with their contribution. They are visible in our apostolate and I would like and I pray that they continue to live that uh, 
affiliation with the Augustinian Recollect communities. And I would thank them for that and continue to live with it. Thank you, Father Bunyao. For your information, Father Bunyao is the newly appointed National Spiritual Advisor or Director of the SARF of the province. No, and uh, when I say province, that includes the lone chapter newly formed in uh, Sierra Leone, no, in Kamalo. Thank you. Father Emil, would you like to add? This will be the last question now. So I would like to add this um, thing about the SARF. Now remember, remember the SARF is not just, a, it is not a mandated parish organization to assist the parish. Rather, the secular Augustine Re is a way of life. And that way of life, no, the Augustine Recollect, is inculcated and shared with the laity, formed in them so that could, they could live this charism no, in their own homes, in their occupational, uh, we might say, ambience. And moreover, it, it is to deepen their baptismal promises. No? guided by the Augustinian Recollect. It is a way of life. No? And that way of life should be maintained all throughout, guided by the, by the spiritual directors of each chapter. Now, if you want to extend or to go further, to want to help the order or the province, you're welcome. No? If you're a doctor, a nurse, you can organize a medical mission in your area, in your vicinity. If you're a lawyer, Give, give, you can give legal counsel to those who are in need without demanding a fee, exacting a fee. If you're an architect or an engineer, no, you could help in planning out, no, in improving your parish or any church building. It is open because it is a way of life. No? A way of life that you could propose and we are ready to listen and we are ready to work together. We, can, we have to work together as a family. And that's the spirit of the Augustinian Recollect way of life. I second the motion. They should continue to be the salt of the earth and light of the world as recollects in the secular world. Thank you, Father Emil. Um, thank you, brothers and sisters, for your active participation in our open forum. Thank you, Father Emil and uh, Father Bunyao, for sharing your time and expertise. And now we are ready to listen to the closing remarks of Father Provincial, Father Dionysio Selma, OAR. Yeah, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, after hearing the four lecture series of OAR story, and today with all the questions and being answered by our speaker and re reactor, I hope hindi kayo na indigest and being fed up with all and be bored with Augustinian ideas, Augustinian doctrines, recollect constitution, charism. Well, at this, at this juncture, I would like to congratulate the RST, Recoleto School of Theology, for organizing this OER story, the lecture series, and in coordination, collaboration with the Recoletos Communication Incorporated, the RCI, and with their uh, active young collaborators for the success of this OER story. And again, I also thank the moderators and the main speaker and the lecturer, no other than our beloved Father Kilatan, as well as the reactors this past days up to today. So we have Fathers Lauro Larlar, Father Potencio, Father, uh, Professor Romanilios, and of course, uh, Father Bunyao. So congratulations to all of them. At the same time, as I was saying, that this lecture chair series is indeed a contribution on our part as the province of San Nicolas de Tolentino celebrates its fourth centenary, the birth of the uh, San Nicolas de Tolentino province, which was born here in the Philippines and was emphasized again in these past uh, lectures. So 
as part of our contribution, we hopefully that they are able to follow some of our uh, presentation, the conferences. And at the same time, this lecture series is also being uh, in line with the ARIF of the REAP, ARIF, Agustinian Recollect Integral Formation of our educational institutions. And indeed, they are very grateful that as part of the Agustinian Recollect family, they are more and more uh, knowledgeable of our way of life, not only the SARF, but including the lay collaborators, because there is already a trend to have some of our administration to be handled by these lay collaborators those who really are also one with us or credible or more or less familiar with our Augustinian Recollect charism. Now, as we end this four lecture series, we have to appreciate history, the importance, the value of knowing who, who we are and what was our origin. It is also to acknowledge the roots, the beginning, of our vocation and more especially the awareness of how God works wonderfully throughout the history of salvation that is part the Philippines and of course the Christian Recollect as we also celebrate the 500 years of Christianity the evangelization and the Recollects also the province of San Nicolas the Tolentino uh, 400 years is not that, that short but really important in the evangelization. But there are so many challenges and, uh, that await us. Questions such as the, that came out during the, the open forum, the question and answer. So after this, what? What are our social responsibilities? We have heard so many uh, good things that our forefathers did. Now after that, ano? Ano namang yari? How are we managing the financial? The reactor, Father Bunya, was also was saying before the creation of the province of San Isquil Moreno, no problem, personnel, uh, formation houses, even money. But how are we managing that now? So there are so many challenges. That is why as we uh, end this lecture series, it's also a challenge to go back, invite ourselves, and review, revisit our own vocation, our calling, and our uh, Augustinian Recollect uh, province, and ask ourselves, what have we done and what can be done after knowing the great work sacrifices that our antepasados, our forebears, have done? Can we, in, in fact, equate that or can we surpass even with intense commitment and enthusiasm to really work for the kingdom of God? Anyway, so it is a challenge and for the present Recollect members of the family as well as uh, our collaborators and those who are also who have heard this passage about St. Augustine, the most monastic ideals and about the charism. Hopefully that with the grace of God who is always the main uh, director of evangelization of our mission, of our vocation, we will be, be able to really fulfill and comply what is his plan for us for the whole world and for our salvation thank you and god bless all of you thank you for participating throughout this uh, lecture series god bless all of you and including your loved ones amen thank you father provincial before we close this program let me acknowledge the following first we thank our organizers of this lecture series, namely the Recoleto School of Theology, the Commission on History, Culture, and Heritage Recoletos, the Commission on Communications and Publications Recoletos, and the Recoletos Communications Incorporated. Second, we are grateful to our resource speaker today, Fry Emil Kilatan and the reactor, Father Bunyao. We are equally grateful to all of you, our dear brothers and sisters, for joining us online. Based on our data here, we pick at 259, 259 participants and uh, 40 Facebook views. Marami na yun. 
Third, we also thank our major superiors for their usual support to our ongoing formation program like this. Father General, Father Provincial, thank you very much. Fourth, we also thank the technical committee, you know, the people working behind the cameras, headed by Fry Rinaldo Haranilla OAR, and assisted by our solemnly professed brothers, Fry Julius Tinapau, Fry James Errol Gatinau, Fry Ricky Austria, also Fry Jerix Vincent Gamulo. Also here, Fry Leander Barot, who, according to Father Bunyao, is the brain behind this lecture series, the overall in charge of this program. Lastly, we thank God above all, to Him be glory and praise. Congratulations, everyone. Happy 400 years. Ad multos an